A young mom mysteriously vanishes from an isolated rural home, leading investigators down a twisted path of lies, deceit, and pure terror in a mysterious and devious wicked attraction. Clifton, Tennessee. The locals call it God's country. Green hills, grazing cattle, and remote farms dot its thick forests. For the Beersdorf family, it's the ideal place to get away from it all and live undisturbed in their own little world. The Biggersdorfs owned about 40 acres in rural Wayne County. This was really an area out in the middle of nowhere. There were very few people around, so this was a property that was very isolated from, from civilization. Though they've lived here for six years, neighbors know very little about reclusive Stephen and Sylvia Beersdorf and their son, Robert. They just didn't share a lot. They didn't share a lot about their, their past. In October 2009, 21-year-old Rose Goggins, the loving mother of their grandson, moves in, while her fiancé, Robert, is away training with the National Guard. Rose is also looking to better herself and is training as an emergency medical technician. She was always a kind person, wanted to take care of people. She was very excited about going back to school. She was really looking forward to it. Rose heads off to her EMT class, but never arrives. That night, she doesn't return. Stephen and Sylvia call Robert where your mama is and reveal Rose has disappeared without a trace and Robert says call the police immediately and um, she hadn't come home it's very unusual for her not to come home and see the baby chief uh, yeah this sounds serious she might want to come in here we had a missing persons report on Rose Goggins thank you deputy yes, all right, tell me again what we've got going on here. Our son's girlfriend, Rose, has not come home. Right from the outset, the sheriff suspects the worst. It didn't sit right with everyone. Uh, when we started talking about it and everything, everyone here just, just, had, just had that bad feeling about this. It's kind of quiet. Kind In many jurisdictions, once an adult is reported missing, the law enforcement wait about 72 hours before they start searching. In this situation, the sheriff started the investigation immediately because he suspected that this was trouble. Investigators seek help from the media, appealing to anyone who thinks they've seen her or her car to come forward. Her future in-laws tell deputies their son, Robert, is rushing home to help with the search. Rose and Robert's love affair began two years earlier. She's a waitress, and he's a smartly dressed sheriff's deputy. You look so good! Well, thank you. I, I like your uniform, too. <laughs> Rose had always had an attraction and just an utmost respect for law enforcement. And so when this guy that she had been recently introduced to came in in a police officer uniform, well, the attraction was even greater. Throughout much of her childhood, Rose has been starved of one of life's essentials, real love. As a nine-year-old, she's a daddy's girl, but loses her father when their home burns to the ground. After meeting Robert, 
he steps in to fill the emotional void in her life. He's been brought up in a strict household and takes Rose home for that all-important first meeting with mom and dad. Remember what I said? You and my mother are gonna get along just fine. Don't worry about my father if he doesn't seem too friendly. It's just his way. Dad? Meet Rose. Good to meet you. Stephen and Sylvia live by their own set of rules in their isolated world, which Rose needs to adapt to and accept. Stephen and Sylvia believed that they were the king and queen of their 40-acre empire. They were the absolute authority. Mom, meet Rose. It's nice to meet you. Robert is proud of his new girl, and the next introductions are with the neighbors. She seemed like a very nice girl. We were happy for him. He seemed, uh, he seemed very happy. Rose is soon hopelessly in love and moves with Robert into a trailer on the farm. Will you marry me? Really? Yeah. Will you marry me? <laughs> yes. <laughs> she can't wait to share her happiness. I kept asking her if she was sure, you know, you have plenty of time to be married. Take time to get to know him a little better. Mm -hmm. Rose isn't the first girlfriend Robert's brought to live on the farm. He's fallen in love before, but his mother drove the girl away. She and Sylvia didn't get along, and she left. And Robert was devastated. It was going to be very difficult for a girl to get her approval. Encouragingly, Sylvia warms to Rose. She had a good relationship with his mom. You know, they would spend quite a bit of time shopping, and you know, she loved their house. Rose soon finds that living with Robert is far different than when they were simply dating. He has a violent temper, especially when he's been drinking. She turns to Sylvia for reassurance and learns what she's experiencing is nothing new. This is simply history repeating itself. As from generation to generation, this is the way Beersdorf men have treated their women. Stephen's strange behavior toward women was learned from his father, who repeatedly abused Stephen's mother. His father believed that his wife was repeatedly unfaithful to him, and Stephen learned that women could not be trusted and could only be controlled through violence. Stephen was emotionally damaged. Stephen, and in turn Robert, are taught to believe that men should always dominate, using brute force when needed. Women are not equal to men. Women were merely property or tools to be used by men and to be punished if they challenged men's authority. And Sylvia had told her that she had dealt with this all her life and so could Rose and, and Rose had called me and told me that she had said that to her and she wouldn't help her Robert's ingrained arrogance isn't just confined to the home hey beer's door just got a call about an accident I need you to go take care of it I'm eating I need you to do it now they can wait till I'm done get your hat and get out of here and go take care of the accident I suppose you could say the position uh, went to his head a bit. He was just not supervisable. He uh, was very belligerent, uh, and he wouldn't do anything anyone told him. After a bad day at work, he knows just who to take his anger out on. Hey, baby. Hey, I, I had a beer waiting for you. Come have some with me. No, Robert, I don't... This is when do you start saying no. I said have a drink. No, please, I don't want... I thought you told me you liked to party. Well, now, clank, clank, time to party. If you're going to marry me, then we're going to drink. I'm not going to tell you twice. Drink it. <laughs> you remember what happened last time you said no? Please. We're not going through that again. Rose tries to adapt to her new subservient role 
and receives welcome news that she prays will bring love back to her relationship. She's going to be a mom. She was excited about being pregnant and having a baby and being able to love someone and have it be her own. Rose's joy at the birth of a baby boy is short-lived. As she discovers, Beersdorf wives can be equally draconian. Sylvia quickly rules Rose, an unfit mother. Give him to me. You won't let your mom hurt you. In Sylvia's eyes, Rose can't do anything right as a mother. She, Sylvia is constantly criticizing Rose for everything she does and, and really just kind of claiming that she's a negligent mother. Her future father-in-law feels the same way. They always just tried to take over, you know, like not let her do the things as a mother. Robert sides with his parents, and now it's three against one. Rose feels like a prisoner, convinced her every move is being monitored and criticized. After yet another violent episode with her fiancé, she makes a desperate call for help. So I told her to, she needed to come into the office and make a report. And she said, well, you know, he's in law enforcement, and he thinks his badge will protect him from everything. I said, well, it won't here. Reassured the authorities will take her claims seriously, Rose Goggins heads downtown to the sheriff's office. But when Robert and his parents find out, there's hell to pay. Sheriff's deputies in Clifton, Tennessee, are searching for 21-year-old Rose Goggins. Mom's gonna see you when she gets home tonight. Last seen leaving her baby son with her boyfriend's parents. Rose was heading out for an EMT class and never arrived. Friends and relatives tell investigators there's no way she would have abandoned her son. I told him there's something wrong. I said there's no way she would leave that baby. Ten months earlier, Rose secretly filed domestic abuse charges against her fiancé, Robert. He grabbed me um, really, really hard and threw me against the wall. I remember the fear in her eyes more than anybody I've ever interviewed on a domestic-related case. I mean, she was trembling, shaking, and she was truly just scared. And that's the most, to me, that's the most scared I've ever seen one of my victims. And and then, and then he threw me in the bed and, and hit me really hard and told me that I couldn't leave. She said that if anything should ever happen to her, that it would be due to her boyfriend or his parents. Are you in danger if you go back home now? I think so. Robert is arrested and taken into custody. Rose's filing of domestic abuse charges shocked and enraged both him and his parents. Who do you think you're talking to? Rose had phone. betrayed the family back. by revealing its secrets of violence. As Sylvia Beersdorf waits with neighbor Jerry Pickett for Robert's release on bond, she makes no secret of what she now thinks of Rose. And she talked about how horrible she was and that she was very manipulative and calculating and how she had set this whole thing up with this domestic dispute. I think she called a lawyer. That she must have had some sort of legal advice to get him arrested. She's just ruining his life, that girl. She just so ranted over her and was horrible. I couldn't imagine talking so terribly about a person. Hey, Mom. After agreeing to attend anger management classes, the charges against Robert are dropped. The one person not waiting for him is his fiance, Rose. She vows never to return to the farm for her own safety and rents an apartment. Ten months later, when Rose disappears, investigators familiar with Robert's violent past treat him as their prime suspect. We knew they had a very volatile relationship, and so that would be the first person you would look at would be him as far as being a suspect. Wasn't perfect, 
Robert tells deputies he's a changed man. The assault charge was a wake-up call. He quits his job in law enforcement and woos Rose back, agreeing to turn over a new leaf. Look, I really wanted to, uh, to tell you that I really want this to work. Robert cuts down on his drinking and tries to be more loving to Rose. And Rose liked that and responded to it. She actually had made the statement to me that if she didn't try to work things out with Robert, that she would never forgive herself. Robert also has a rock-solid alibi. When Rose vanished, he was out of state, training with the National Guard, 300 miles away. Where's Rose? What happened? She probably ran off with some other guy like we told you she was gonna. I told you Rose isn't seeing any other men. Well, we ain't seen her. We haven't seen her, son. We started calling uh, down to Camp Shelby, Mississippi. We talked to his commanding officer. We talked to his squad sergeant. We talked to his lieutenant. And they all verified that he hadn't been off base. Those who love Rose cling to the hope that perhaps she simply run away again. Seen this girl? Then I was just hoping someone out here had maybe seen her. I'm sorry. If I, you know. Thank you. We're going to find her son. Don't you worry about it. All right? It's three days since she vanished, and there's shattering news. Rose's car is found 60 miles away on a remote logging track. The car was found burning totally in the opposite direction that she would have been going to her EMT class. I was 99% sure that we had a homicide. Someone was trying to cover up something. That's the reason it was burned. As I got the phone call that a car was found, then I started losing hope that she was going to be okay. Robert is heartbroken by the news. But his parents, Stephen and Sylvia, appear detached and unemotional. They didn't seem that concerned. Deputies begin delving deeper into their relationship with their future daughter-in-law. It's exceedingly rare for grandparents to commit murder within the family. The FBI reports that less than 1% of grandparents are ever arrested for homicide. Investigators discover Sylvia is still seething over Rose filing the abuse charge against Robert and files her own complaint, reporting Rose as an unfit mother. Miss Goggins, I'm from Trial Protective Services. I'm here because we've received a report that you were seen shaking your son. I need you to come with me. <laughs> but that's ridiculous. Who told you that? Ma'am, please, come with me. The baby is put through a series of grueling medical tests to ensure he's unharmed. This shows that Sylvia will say anything and do anything to punish Rose for her betrayal. Things are only going to get worse. After the test, she called me and she was crying so hard. She said, Grandma, Sylvia would feel really bad if she knew the hell that they put the baby through because the test was so terrible. Everyone outside of the Beersdorf's family described Rose as nothing but a loving and devoted mother, that she was totally dedicated to her son. Rose is cleared of any wrongdoing, but Sylvia is not done stirring up trouble. Son, that girl, she is ruining our lives. She ruined your career. She is a lousy mother, and I think she's running around on you behind your back. Look, just stay out of it, all right? Rose is not cheating on me, so stay out of it! When Robert learns his unit is about to be shipped off for training and then to Afghanistan, he persuades Rose to leave her apartment and move in with his parents. Against her better judgment, she agrees hoping the presence of her baby boy will mellow her future in-laws. In addition to fixing the relationship with Robert, Rose really wanted to also 
allow the grandparent, Steve and Sylvia, to see their new grandchild. I think that the family unit was important to her. As soon as Robert leaves, Rose wilts as the Beersdorfs continue to insist she's a lousy mom. What the hell are you doing? Are you crazy? I just turned away for a minute. What does she do now? She left the boy alone on the counter. Can't you do anything right? She told me that she stayed up in the bedroom most of the time with the, with the baby. She's the only time I go down there, Grandma, is when I have to get something for the baby to, to feed him. She said, otherwise, I spend most of my time up in the room. Terrorized and alone, the young mother once more begins to crack. They treated Rose miserably, not as grandparents of a child should. The investigation into her disappearance takes a dramatic and unexpected turn when an inmate at the county jail offers new information. He says he can reveal what's happened to Rose Goggins. <laughs> Sheriff's deputies in Wayne County, Tennessee, are convinced Rose Goggins has been murdered after her car is found torched three days after she disappeared. An inmate at the local jail comes forward and reveals he's been working at the farm where Rose was living. And Sylvia Beersdorf had plenty to say about the mother of her grandson. I go back in there and listen to that girl some more. You know, she nearly dropped that baby again. She's ridiculous. She know how to change him. She know how to hold him. She don't do nothing. I wish she was gone, you know? I wish she was dead. She wished Rose wasn't in the picture and, and how that it would be a lot better if Rose wasn't in the picture. Hey, you want to make some money? What are you talking about? Well, about $1,000 to take care of her. What do you want done? No body, no murder. And they even made mention that they didn't want to do it until Robert was in Camp Shelby so he wouldn't be a suspect. Police begin digging deeper into Stephen Beersdorf's background and learn he was raised in a tiny town in the hills of Alabama. His alcoholic and violent father made his childhood a misery. His mother walks out, and when Stephen is 12, his father remarries. By 16, Stephen finds happiness falling in love with 13-year-old Sylvia. Together, they run away to Florida. Stephen and Sylvia ran off as emotionally damaged teenagers and developed a mentality of us against the world, trusting no one. Sylvia thought that Stephen would be her protector but he turns out to be just like his father. He ended up abusing her, and they developed a dynamic where Stephen was the master and Sylvia was the slave. They eventually marry, and Stephen hears devastating news. In a drunken rage, his father has killed his stepmother. Sylvia gives birth to Robert, and they move to Tennessee in 2004. Jerry and Jimmy Pickett live a mile up the road from the Beersdorf's new farm. We thought they were a family that was needing a fresh start, moving to a small town, looking for that small town atmosphere. So we reached out to them and became, I guess you could say, friendly. Over time, a darker side of Stephen emerges. And his Tennessee farm is not a place to visit without an invitation. They had a neighbor's dog, a very expensive dog that was coming into their yard from time to time.
and he bragged to me how he shot it and cut its throat and then took it to his neighbor's house and laid it on their front steps. Having witnessed how Sylvia destroyed Robert's previous relationship, what does she do now? It's no surprise to hear her start bad-mouthing Rose. Can't you do anything right? No girl was really going to make Sylvia happy. <laughs> Sylvia wants Robert to believe yes. <laughs> that no woman will ever love him as much as she does. Hi, Hi Sylvia. How are you? You really want to know that girl that Robert's with, Rose? Oh, oh she is lazy. She is manipulative. She has got him wrapped around her finger, and I swear she is turning him against me, and she is just disrupting everything in my house. It wasn't just about a mother not wanting a particular girl for her son. It, it, was, it was more seated than that. She'd pull me to the side and just talk about how bad of a person she was. Investigators learn after the baby is born, Sylvia has a hundred new reasons to find fault with Rose. You are doing that wrong. Give him to me. She wasn't a horrible mother. She was very attentive to the baby. Very attentive, very loving. So I'm starting to think these stories are not matching up. She can't be this, this bitch that they've all referred her to. The Pickets believe it might be best just to stay away. I knew that he was not a person not to get along with. He was somebody you didn't want to mess with. And that's just what Rose is thinking, as she has plenty of time to regret moving in with the Beersdorfs. It's a pressure cooker. Rose felt like a prisoner of war, with her baby held hostage, and at any time, she could be terrorized by her captors. Where the hell do you think you're going dressed like that? I'm just going out. You look like a whore. <laughs> I don't look like a whore. These are normal clothes. Well, you look like a hooker. Don't talk back to me. Now get your ass back upstairs and change. The couple's cutting remarks take on a more sinister tone. Rose called me crying hysterically and telling me, they told me that they could kill me and put my body in the river and nobody would ever find it. Stephen and Sylvia believe that Rose is their common enemy. And I said, Rose, just come back to Ohio. He said, you don't have to be there with that. Rose is frightened and feels trapped. She knocks on her neighbor's door. Rose, baby, what is going on? What is wrong? Are you okay? <laughs> she went from being a very easy and playful and, and a nice girl to a very scared girl. <laughs> they won't even talk to me unless they're screaming at me about what a horrible mother I am. I told her to pray. <laughs> I told her to pray. And she said she had. I wish I'd done more. I just had no idea how serious it was. I had no idea. A week later, Rose Goggins vanishes. Police are more convinced than ever Stephen and Sylvia Beersdorf can unlock the secret of what's happened to Rose Goggins. Get more Wicked Attraction online. Sheriff's deputies in Wayne County, Tennessee, fear missing young mom, Rose Goggins, may have been murdered and suspect her future in-laws know far more than they're saying. So that's when we made the decision to have Tennessee Bureau of Investigation come in and interview them. Bureau officers descend on the farm and probe the couple's relationship 
throws. There was some tension in the house. Do you think your parents had anything to do with their disappearance? No, of course not. Stephen makes it clear he's a man of tradition. Uh, I usually like to get up early, uh, have my coffee, and then when the women get up, uh, I like to leave the house because I don't, I don't usually like to be around the women if I don't have to. He said that he didn't generally talk to Rose unless his son was present. He just didn't speak to women that didn't belong to him. Despite reports to the contrary, Sylvia claims all was well on the farm and Rose is part of the family. We all got along very well here. There were so many things about their initial story that didn't, didn't ring true. Investigators hope that by separating the couple, one of them will crack. Sylvia agrees to go down to the station and undergo a voice stress test, which will show if she's lying. You sure you never mentioned killing her? To him, Rose was a bad mother. He talked about the fact that, that Rose and his wife did not get along, and that because of that, his wife stayed upset a lot. Rose broke his most sacred rule. Where the hell do you think you're going? She was disrespectful. You look like a hooker. Don't talk back to me. She disrespected me on my property. She disrespected my family. Get back upstairs and change right now. Stephen remains guarded in his responses, but also agrees to take a voice stress test. He said, if that test says that I did it, then I did it. Let's go take it. At the sheriff's office, Sylvia, as usual, has plenty to say. She began to talk about the fact that Rose was not a fit mother and that she had mistreated her child. Then Sylvia makes an unexpected admission. She's had a go. Stephen and Sylvia hate Rose, but love the baby. To have the baby, Rose must be eliminated. So I talked to Steve. I told Steve she had a, she should be killed. Sylvia certainly has psychopathic tendencies. Sylvia was so conditioned to violence that in her warped view, she believed the police would understand her motives. With the plot to kill Rose revealed, investigators go back to Stephen Beersdorf. The evidence in this case, at this point, indicates that you were involved in a disappearance and the murder of Rose Goggins. Why did you do it, Steve? Don't really matter why. By the way, I'm going to get the electric chair death penalty. Sylvia told him, I want her killed. And he said that he would have it done. <laughs> he said to me, and I quote, I choked the bitch to death. She was still alive for a, for a short period of time because of gasping noises that she was making. He described stopping at a convenience store, purchasing two liter soft drink bottles, emptying them, filling them with gasoline, and then continuing on until it gets to a point where there's a bridge that crosses um, the Tennessee River. He told me that he had no regard for, for Rose and that he had no regard for human life, period. It was very cold. Stephen claims he threw Rose's body into the water before driving to a remote logging track to torch her car. claims to have hitchhiked home. And we felt like that probably wasn't the case, that there was probably somebody that he knew that assisted him in getting back. You know, Stephen performed the murder himself. 
Investigators tell Sylvia her husband has confessed to the murder. When we told her that, she became very, very upset. But she ain't hurting that baby anymore, is she? I guess that bitch got what she deserved, finally. And she portrayed the fact that it was her understanding, at least, that he was going to hire someone or contract someone to kill her for him, that he wouldn't actually um, commit the murder himself. Her, her demeanor completely changes. She went into this very evil, demonic tone. And I did what anybody would have done in my situation if you don't sit in that house and see it yourself. Sylvia and Steven Beersdorf are charged with first-degree murder. Rose's family is given the devastating news they've always feared. They'd taken us into the police station and, and just told us that it had gone from a search and rescue to a search and recovery. And, and I just said I knew it. I knew they did something to her. Robert is told it was his parents who slaughtered the lovely Rose. He was destroyed. He was devastated. He couldn't understand how his, the, the grandparents of his child could have been involved in the murder of, of their mother. Police begin to search the Tennessee River for Rose's body. Hundreds of volunteers were out there searching a 10-mile stretch of the Tennessee River. We had some air support. We had cadaver dogs. These dogs could actually smell uh, in the water and see if there had been decaying flesh there. After three days of searching, police find no sign of Rose's body. My gut says she's not there. She's not in the water. What happened to Rose? If Steven Beersdorf is lying, investigators wonder what other secrets he's holding back about what's happened to Rose Goggins. Steven Beersdorf has confessed he strangled Rose Goggins, destroyed her car, and dumped her corpse in the Tennessee River. But after a detailed search, investigators are convinced he doesn't want them to find Rose's body. He thought if he could conceal the body, and we never found the body, that we could never charge him with murder. The search moves to the Beersdorf's 40-acre property, where there's a mysterious burn pile. I got me a stick, 12 inches long, something like that, and just started raking. I got a foul odor of smell like flesh, blood, or something like that, decomposed material. And then I could smell diesel mixed in. I said, something ain't right. What is this? What is it? What you got? What do you got, Rick? Looks like a picture from a book of a, a heart. She was studying to be an EMT. Investigators recover a piece of charred flesh. A DNA test confirms the remains are female. As soon as we got that results back, it was just like a quiet moment. Every one of us went quiet. It got, it got emotional. We were pretty sure we found Miss Rose Goggins. Over the course of several days, forensic specialists pulled tiny shards of skull fragments from the burn pile. Three pieces. In the end, all that's left of Rose Goggins can fit in a teacup. Now, investigators know the full story of the kind-hearted young mom's diabolical death. What he did was he just 
he burned the body and then he chopped chopped it with a he had a rake there and he would rake it burn it rake it burn it and this went on until he was satisfied that he had destroyed the entire body Police believe Stephen Beersdorf even used the farm's backhoe to crush Rose's remains. What kind of person has, can do that? I don't understand. A monster, maybe? Based on the statements that both Sylvia and Stephen gave us, they wanted the child. They wanted their grandchild. And they wanted to raise that child uh, and care for that child without any involvement or interference on the part of Rose. Stephen Beersdorf takes a plea deal and trades a possible death sentence for life in prison. He admitted to killing Rose Goggins. He never told the truth, in our opinion, about how he killed her. We'll never really know the method that was used to kill Rose Goggins. Shy of, of, of somebody coming forth with a murder weapon that was handed to them um, that we weren't aware of before, I don't know that we'll ever know. And there was no remorse whatsoever, zero, none. He was as cold as ice. Sylvia Beersdorf didn't physically harm Rose, but is just as guilty. What we could prove from the witnesses and the physical evidence was that she encouraged Stephen to kill Rose. She don't do nothing. Wish she was gone, you know? I wish she was dead. Any active participation on her part as far as physically involved in the act of killing Rose, uh, we could not prove. She pled to conspiracy to commit first degree murder. In a plea deal, She's sentenced to 15 years. Initially, I thought that he was one to be feared, but the longer that I got to know the two of them, you knew that she was the one pulling the strings. She was the one ruling the roost. Many still speculate Sylvia knew all along what was going to happen to Rose. Ooh, I wonder where your mama is. Oh, there she is. That takes one cold-blooded human. I couldn't do an animal that way, much less uh, the mother of my grandchild. I will never, ever try to begin to understand what were in the minds of those two people. What makes a person cross that line? I don't know. That's the million-dollar question. Here we have two psychopaths creating their own bizarre world, their fortress. Their wicked attraction was that they believed they could be the judge, jury, and executioner of Rose's acts of treason. 